anything that we want to discuss uh, from previous videos or I mean, yes no <laughs> um, so let's just bring our awareness back to our body bring our awareness back to the sensation of self It'll bring our awareness back to becoming aware of gravity, how gravity affects our body, the pressure points perhaps under our feet, under our legs. Become aware of the internal sensation of balance how our head is balanced on our neck, balanced on our shoulders. Even do our best to become aware of the bones in our body, the skeletal system, the support system. And perhaps, you know, try to become aware of the marrow in our bones. Within the Old Testament, the Torah and the Tanakh, uh, there are three different words that have all been translated as soul, breath, spirit. One is nefesh, and that's the spirit that enters with the flesh. And the other is ruach, which is the spirit that enters with the bones. And the other is uh, neshama, which is the spirit that is in the marrow. In the New Testament, St. Paul translates these into Greek or uses the Greek terms soma, psyche, pneuma. Body, soma, and then the psyche, soul, and pneuma, spirit. One of them, the fleshy self, represents ourself in world 48. It represents the slumbering state. The self with ruach or psyche, bones. And Ezekiel's valley of dry bones, and there's all sorts of metaphors with bones in the uh, Old Testament with the use of the word ruach, is the self in world 24. So this is the realm of mindful awareness, self-reflectivity, personal consciousness. So it's something that we actually share with all vertebrates on the planet, but we have it an exceptional degree and quality of it. Even the tiniest guppy or the smallest fish uh, is capable of being self-reflective, of being aware of itself. But usually for those lower forms of invertebrates, it's when they are being hunted and they, at the moment of their death, when they're about to be eaten, they have this self-reflectivity. Whereas we can consciously control this self-reflectivity. We can, you know, we've got a centralized nervous system with the spinal column. And then, this is the metaphor in the Bible, within the bones is the marrow. And the marrow represents the real I, the self in world 12. So we have these components within ourselves. To be aware of the fleshy component of our body. So the muscles, the tendons, the ligaments, uh, to be aware of that part that decays first, after death. And then we have something more permanent within us, which is our bones. So this represents, you know, what would be called the Kesjian body or the astral self. And it has a greater lifespan than the physical body, but it's, a more, it's mortal as well. And then we have the 
area of the real eye, sort of the hidden dimension of our being. So try to become aware of your flesh. Try to become aware of your bones. Try to become aware of your marrow. And let's just start with the right arm. Try to become aware of the flesh in your right arm. So the muscles in your upper arm, biceps, the muscles in your lower arms, the muscles, flesh, skin, blood, tendons, ligaments in your hands, in your whole right arm. And then try to become aware of the flesh in your right leg. To become aware of the uh, muscles, tendons, ligaments, blood. And then try to become aware of the flesh in your left leg. And finally, for this bit, try to become aware of the flesh in your uh, left arm. And then bring your awareness to, you know, perhaps the flesh in your lower torso, middle torso, upper torso. So this would include your liver, pancreas, gallbladder. It would include your heart. It would include your lungs. And try to bring it up to the flesh in your neck and then the fleshy part in your head. So this would include skin, eyes, tongue, even the gray matter inside our skull. And then let's do this again, but for the bones. Try to become aware of the bone in your upper right arm. And then the two bones in your lower right arm. And the bones in your hands and fingers. And then let's do the same for the right leg. There's a single bone, the thigh bone. Below the knee, there are two bones. And then the bones in our feet. And then the left leg. You know, again, the single bone in the thigh, the two bones in the lower leg, the bones in the feet. And then the left arm, the single bone in the upper arm, the two bones in the lower arm, and the various bones in the hands. And then let's bring our attention to our pelvic bone. And then move up to our sacrum, our tailbone. Hey, Tui. And then up through the various vertebrae. So let's start with the sacral five, the lowest vertebrae, and move up to four, three, two, one, and then into the lower back, the lumbar region. Um, lumbar five, four, three, two, one. And then to the middle back, into the thoracic region, uh, thoracic 12, 11, 10 nine, eight, towards the upper back of our spine, uh, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. And then let's just go back a little bit and go back down to our ribs and become aware of our ribs and our breastbone and then our collarbone and then move up into our cervical vertebrae, cervical seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. And then let's bring our awareness into our jawbone. And then the facial bones in the upper part of the face. And then the frontal bone with our forehead. And the temporal bones at the side of our head. And then the parietal bone at the top of our head. And the occipital bone in the back of our head. Now, we actually have two different forms of marrow. We have yellow marrow that leads to the creation of white blood cells. And we have red marrow. The yellow marrow is found in our long bones. So do your best in whatever way you can to become aware of the yellow marrow in your arms. Your upper arm, 
your lower arm, the yellow marrow in those long bones. And then become aware as best you can of the yellow marrow in your right leg, the up uh, the thigh bone, and then the the lower leg bones. And then let's move over to the left leg, the yellow marrow in the thigh bones, and the yellow marrow in the two bones in the lower left leg. And then the left arm, the yellow marrow in the upper arm, and the yellow marrow in the lower arm. And then now let's move through the red marrow. Try to become aware of the red marrow in your pelvic bone. Try to become aware of the red marrow up through the vertebrae in your spine, the red marrow in your rib cage, your breastbone, your collarbone. And then the red marrow in the bones in your head. So your jawbone, facial bone, the various bones in your skull, the frontal bone, the temporal bone at the side, the uh, uh, parietal bone at the top of your skull, the occipital bone in the back of your skull. And understand too that these represent levels of consciousness they represent different aspects of ourself so the fleshy self is the animalistic self it's the carnal self it's the mechanical self it's the machine like self it's the self that where you get lost in the state of waking sleep the bone self is the realm of personal consciousness. It's connected with the Kesjian body. It's connected with the self in world 24, that more mindful self, capable of self-reflectivity. And then the marrow self is the real I, the self in world 12, the awakened self. And so these are both metaphors, and there is something real about them as well. But they can help us understand ourselves, help us understand these different parts within our being. So again, try to bring your attention back to your fleshy self. Try to be aware of it from the bottom of your feet to the top of your head. Try to be aware of the flesh in your feet, uh, ankles, lower legs, knees, upper legs, hips, buttocks. Try to be aware of the flesh in your hands, wrists, lower arms, elbows, upper arms. Then try to become aware of the flesh in your lower torso, your lower back and uh, lower abdomen, the flesh in your middle back, midriff, solar plexus, the flesh in your upper back and chest, and then the flesh in your shoulders, your neck, and the flesh in your head. Try to become aware of the flesh in your whole body, from the bottom of your feet all the way to the top of your head. And then let's do this again for the bones. Try to become aware of the bones in your feet. The bones in your ankles, lower legs, knees, upper legs, hips. The bones in your hands, wrists, lower arms, elbows, upper arms. The bones in your lower spine, your middle spine. The bones in your chest, so your spinal column in the chest, your ribs your breastbone, your collarbone, and then moving up to the bones in your neck, and then your jawbone, facial bone, and the various bones and plates in your skull. And then try to become aware of your whole skeletal system, the bones in your body from the bottom of your feet all the way 
to the top of your head and even become aware of the fact that your bones are like scaffolding and without your bones you would just be this blob of flesh and it's our bones that give us structure they give us an inner form and then become aware of the marrow you know the marrow in the bones in your feet your lower legs or your ankles lower legs knees upper legs hips your pelvic bone the bones in your hands and fingers wrists uh, lower arms elbows upper arms the bones in your lower back middle back the bones in your upper back and chest so your vertebral your spinal column there your rib cage your breastbone your collarbone the bones in your neck your jawbone facial bone the various bones in your skull try to become aware of your skeletal self and then try to become aware of the marrow something deeper try to become aware of the marrow in your feet your lower legs knees upper legs hips the marrow in your hands lower arms upper arms the marrow in your lower vertebrae middle vertebrae the marrow in your upper vertebrae your rib cage your breastbone the marrow in your cervical vertebrae in your neck and the marrow in your jawbone facial bones and the plates in your head and become aware that we exist across a whole spectrum and that not only do these three levels the flesh bones and marrow represent the three levels of man we are more than three story beings those are the, the 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 levels that define us and that we can use to explore ourselves but in whatever way you can try to become aware of your mineral self this is actually the self in world 768 and then try to become your metal self your metal self the, the metals the iron the the, the potassium um, the various metals that compose your body and then become aware of the mineral self this is the self in world 364 and then become aware of the self the vegetative self of the world 192 and again the air that we breathe in is also at 192 before it begins the transformation breath begins as do 192 192 is also the realm of the vegetative self the plants so there's a point of commonality and a way of understanding how these connect and how they manifest within ourselves then we come up to the invertebral self which is the self in world 96 the self that is on the same level as the moon in terms of the ray of creation so we can ask what is the moon within us what is the uh, invertebral self what part of us do we share for instance with lobsters with insects with creatures that are not plants they can move around but they don't have a skeletal system they don't have a centralized nervous system their 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 hard part is quite often on the outside like lobsters there's a self that exists within us at that level and this is where we can begin to explore ourselves because we are three-story beings and 
for slumbering man at their lowest level in the basement is the invertebral self. It's the self that is on the level of, like I said, lobsters, insects, and the moon. So we have points of comparison. We can study what it means at the ray of creation point of the moon. We can study the invertebrates and we can study and try to find that similarity within ourselves. And then we have the vertebral self, which is the self in world 48. And we, or excuse me, we have the fleshy self, the animal self, the self in world 48. And then we have the vertebral self, the spinal column, particularly that aspect of self reflectivity in world 12. And then the marrow self in world, or excuse me, world 12. The other one was world 24. If any of you have ever looked at the Gnostic Gospels that were found in Nag Hammadi in northern Egypt, they talk about the marrow self. It's a very important part of their teachings. So try to become aware that, you know, we are separate individual beings, but we are connected to these different essence classes, these different classes of life on the one hand, and we are also connected to the ray of creation on the other. And through a process almost of triangulation, by studying the cosmos, studying the macrocosmic level, which is the ray of creation on the one hand, and then studying organic life on Earth on the other, realizing that there are levels of similarity and levels of equalness where they're the same thing, but reflected in a different way. And we can stand in the middle and we can use the ray of creation on the one hand and use organic life on planet Earth on the other to get a much clearer understanding of ourselves. So become aware of your fleshy self. Become aware of your skeletal self. Become aware of your marrow self and recognize that understanding these connections can really help us to figure out who we are and then just allow your attention to rest just allow your attention to rest and i would like you to imagine that you are surrounded by an atmosphere you don't really have to imagine, try to sense it, try to feel it, try to perceive it. Mr. Gurdjieff said that for a normal person, that is one who hasn't really begun to develop at the higher level, this atmosphere is composed of three different qualities. One that comes from sensation, one that comes from feeling, and one that comes from perception. So body, brain, feeling, brain, head, brain. Become aware of the atmosphere around your body. And this atmosphere can be dispersed. It can be torn off and go in all sorts of directions. And it's our job to collect it, to keep it within a boundary of perhaps a meter, a meter and a half, four to six feet around us, like an orb or a sphere or a cocoon. And keep it limited. Try to become aware of the boundary of your atmosphere. Keep it tranquil. Keep it still. Keep it contained. And we keep it tranquil by keeping our mind tranquil, by keeping our feelings tranquil by keeping our sensations tranquil. And in a moment, I'm gonna count from one to three. And when I get to three, just breathe it in. And then as you exhale, imagine something higher, 
some kind of higher particles from your atmosphere that you breathed in remain within yourself to help grow yourself at the higher level. One, two, three. Breathe it in, and then as you breathe out, you know, represent to yourself however you can that something remains. And then let's finish by silently repeating the affirmation. May results from this exercise be transubstantiated within me for my being. And then just slowly come back. Um, just slowly bring yourself back. Um, and I'm going to share the screen with uh, the picture that I've been working on uh, for the last two weeks. And so we kind of did this in this guided exercise. On a macrocosmic level or a, on a cosmological level, the ray of creation begins with the absolute. And then it moves down to all worlds, all suns, the sun, all planets, earth, and the moon. And this is our particular ray of creation. We can't speak of other rays of creation, but within ours. And we can define these. We can say that the absolute is twice as intelligent, twice as vibrant, twice as refined, uh, half as dense as all worlds. So from one down to another, it's either a halving, you know, dividing in two, or it's a doubling. So it's a doubling of in, uh, density, but it's a halving of intelligence. And so each step down gets denser and heavier and stupider and less intelligent. And these are also levels of consciousness, so half as conscious. And these also give us clues and insights. The self at the planetary realm you know, where we develop the Kesjian body. This is the mindful self, the personally conscious self. So to be mindful of our body, to be mindful of our breath, to be mindful of what we can see, hear, smell, taste, to be mindful of what we are feeling is half as intelligent twice as dense as the real I, but it's twice as intelligent and twice as vibrant as the dimension of our being, the mechanical self, the carnal self, the slave-like self in world 48. And so understanding this process gives us a way to begin to look at ourselves. As I've mentioned in uh, the, the last two um, meetings, that you cannot study psychology in isolation of cosmology, just like you cannot study cosmology in isolation of psychology. These things apply to us. So on the one hand, we can look at the ray of creation. We can understand the ray of creation in terms of intelligences, densities, vibration, levels of consciousness. And we can use this insight to really refine 
our understanding of what these different levels are. And then, you know, going over to the left, um, particularly down in the, the, the bottom where I'm circling, the hierarchy of beings, which are also the names of the different squares. So it starts with the absolute, then the eternal unchanging, then the archangels, angels, man, vertebrates, invertebrates, plants, minerals, metals. And again, you know, with the guided meditation, we have a metallic self, a mineral self, a plant self, an invertebral self, a vertebral self. These all exist within us right now. As long as we have a body, as long as we are here as embodied beings breathing, we have all of these different dimensions within us. Now, a metaphor that I came up with a number of years ago is that we are born with a fully developed physical body. And I've brought up before the uh, diagram that comes from the Willem Nyland group. Uh, we are born with half an emotional body. And we are just born with a note do at the level of the real eye. And so we must uh, grow the emotional body. We must nurture it. We must develop it. We have to grow that self in world 24, the personally conscious, mindful self. And then the highest body, the real I, it's like it's just an embryonic form. Um, I believe Willem Nyland actually said to imagine it as a single cell and to try to get that cell to replicate and multiply and grow and become something substantial. But we look at that and we can understand that the real I, that self exists on the same level as the angels. If we look at organic life on planet Earth and the diagram of all living things, we can begin to realize that, you know, the, 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 the medieval scholars and monks said that, you know, the angels are a little intimidated by an awakened human being. Because although the awakened human being exists on their level, the awakened human being had to struggle through conscious labors and intentional suffering. They had to forge their being sort of in a blast furnace. And as a result, even though they are on the same level, they arrived at it through the process of self-evolution and are therefore greater than the angels. But so a person at the level of the real eye who's growing that part of themselves can be said to be an angelic being. So again, these similarities, these ways of looking at ourself in relation to these other levels. And, you know, objective consciousness, the consciousness of hydrogen 12, of the awakened man is the consciousness of the angels. This is not a subjective consciousness. It's not about me. It's actually to achieve this level. One of the things we have to do is we have to get rid of a lot of illusions, delusions, beliefs, in order to really perceive reality from an objective perspective. And part of what I'm doing now in terms of these diagrams is helping to grow that objective perspective. You know, when I was born, my parents named me Alan. And then, oh, look at Alan. Oh, see Alan. Oh, hey, good morning, Alan. And as a baby, 
They didn't call me you. They didn't call me he. They called me Alan. And I took this to be a reality, as we all do. Who are you? I'm Alan. But from an objective perspective, I'm not Alan. That's a subjective label. It's a fiction that has been applied to me. And I mentioned it before, boundaries, national boundaries are collective hallucinations that we as people, you know, use and draw under lakes and oceans and whatever, but it has no objective reality. Our national boundaries on this planet only exist in the mind of human beings and nowhere else in reality. They are collective hallucinations, as is the pieces of paper we carry around in our body. Uh, I saw a video where someone who is fairly, I'm aware, interesting person by the name of Joe Marshalla said that uh, they tried to figure out, and they call it consensual reality or collective hallucinations. What is the biggest collective hallucination humanity shares? And it is, at least here in Toronto, it's 11.08 on Sunday, February the 3rd, 2019. So everyone in the world, oh, it's Sunday and it's Monday. It's really a collective hallucination. It's a subjective reality. So at that level of objective consciousness, at the level of the angels, at the level of the sun, we transcend that and we begin to perceive reality as it really is from an objective level. Then stepping down, I use the word mindful, but that's just because it has um, a contemporary cachet with the awareness of mindfulness. Mr. Gurdjieff actually used the word personally conscious. There's a subjective level to it. It's about me. It's the awareness of my body, my perceptions. Personally conscious is supposed to be the true level of man where we really should be centered. But, you know, with the invention of uh, writing and reading and the development now even worse now with information technology and mass media and all sorts of things, we've degenerated. But to become aware of our breath, to become aware of our body, to become aware of these self-reflective perceptions is to be personally conscious. And although from our normal waking sleep state, it seems so much more vibrant, it's twice as vibrant, twice as intelligent, twice as aware as the level of waking sleep, it's only half as intelligent, half as aware, half as vibrant as that level of objective consciousness. And then waking sleep. This is, you know, where we share with most of the vertebrates, even though vertebrates are capable at their highest story, at their highest level of achieving that state of self-reflectivity. For the most part, it's this dreamlike slumbering state. And if we look at the vertebrates, Pavlov's dogs, food ringing a bell, causing the salivation, training a dog to sit, to shake a paw, to fetch. This is the habitual self. It's the automatic self. It's the self that is ruled by all of these habitual subroutines. 
And this is actually necessary for our survival. If every time you walked into a room and saw an object and said, hmm, four legs, a back, a seat, I think that's a chair. And, oh, that round thing, I think it's a door handle. And that rectangular thing, I think it's a door. And if I turn that handle, perhaps I will open the door. And so, so much of our reality is habitual. So much of our reality is programmed in. You look at the words on the screen, the center, one, the absolute. These words do not exist on your screen. On your screen are just lines and squiggles and shapes. These words actually exist in your brain. So when you look at these words, you superimpose the meaning on them. So if they were in a different language, if they were in the Cyrillic alphabet of Russian or Sanskrit, they could still be phonological, but you would not have any way of understanding or reading them. Chinese is even more alien. It's because we've learned these and we've habituated to them. Mr. Gurdjieff talked about language as an automaton. So these words, these numbers, are really habitual projections on to these squiggles. If you had to look at the one and go, hmm, up and down, that looks like it could be a one, and then you had to go, I, B, B, S, so, and figure out it said absolute. It would take you so long to do it as if you had never seen this before. So there's an element of necessity behind the habitual self. If you erased all habitual programs, you would forget that a door handle can be round, it can be a lever, it can be just uh, you know, uh, something we grip onto. You would forget that a door can be small, big, it can open in or out. You would forget chairs, light switches, windows, floors, ceilings. You would forget everything and you would not be able to function in the world. And this means that even when a person becomes personally conscious, even when they step up to the awakened level, they do not leave this behind, but they build on it and they grow it. Now, because we are stuck in such habitual routines where we are little more than thinking animals, it becomes important to try to do our best to stop some of these processes, to become aware of them, to become aware of which leg you use to step up on a set of stairs, which leg you put into your pants when you wake up in the morning, which hand you use to open doors. And to bring that self-reflectivity, that mindful awareness to these habitual tasks. And you can even change it to step up with the other leg, to put the other leg in the pants, to reach with the other arm. In order to begin to break these habits, but you can't break all of the habits. You cannot look at the writing on the screen and see squiggles instead of words. So there's a limit to what we can do. But the thing is to recognize that we are multi-story beings. And if every time we had to walk down a street, we had to say, that's a car, it's moving, that's a street light. 
we would be dead. So we don't get rid of that self. It's not the enemy, but we build on it. We grow. Life is this process of the higher evolving out of the lower, the higher growing from the lower. So that's the level of waking sleep. It's also the uh, uh, world 12, um, the sun, the angels, the awakened man is the awake level. The intermediate level is the level of personally conscious where we be, are starting to sort some of the threads out and starting to stop certain habitual routines in order to grow ourselves at that other level. So there's elements of subjectivity and objectivity intermingled, whereas the slumbering level, it's a subjective realm. Mr. Gurdjieff said that uh, there's the state of consciousness, sleep, and in sleep we dream. But when we wake up, we're still asleep and we're still dreaming. But we don't realize that we're dreaming. We don't realize that our thoughts, what we think of, our imagination are just dreams while we're walking around. And he said that these dreams that we have in the state of waking sleep are far more dangerous than the dreams we have when we're slumbering because we can move about and do things. So at the level of the slumbering self, the level of the vertebrates, you know, look at a dog, look at mammals, look at training, look at how they habituate to things. Look at how they learn their environment. And we can bring a similitude. We can look at the earth on the ray of creation. We can look at the earth as twice as dense, twice as stupid, half as conscious as the planetary realm. So we have this earthly self. And we can use these different levels, these different understandings, the cosmological level, the level of life, organic life on planet Earth, to study ourselves. And we can also study ourselves and use the understanding of ourselves to understand these other levels, to you, uh, the, the problem with the level of waking sleep is that a machine is incapable of observing itself. And self-observation and self-study, anything that Mr. Gurdjieff, where this word self with a hyphen, is actually a world 24 phenomenon. So self-study, self-reflectivity, self-observation are, are stepping up to that higher level. A machine is incapable of observing itself. It's incapable of self-reflectivity. It's incapable of that level of awareness. And this is why we must Study ourself in World 48, and it's impossible to study ourselves from within World 28 or World 48. And this leads to distortions. Because the minute we step up to that other level to observe ourselves at the lower level, we're no longer at that lower level. But understanding the relationships between these numbers and these different terms and the cosmological and the organic life and the, the, the personal, we can begin to see things. 
Now, Mr. Gurdjieff said that we have to learn to take pictures of ourselves in World 48, brief snapshots. And if you're in a completely darkened room with a light and you stare at the light and by completely darkened, you know, windowless or dark curtains, you stare at the light and then you turn out the light, the image of the light will linger in your brain for a fraction of a second. And this is like a reverse metaphor because the moment we self-remember the moment we step up to that level it's like the state we were in before that image just for a fraction of a second like the light remains one image does nothing, 10, 100, 1,000. But over time, we begin to build up a picture of ourself at that slumbering level of waking sleep. And then we can begin to assemble these pictures in order to look at ourselves. So it is possible to study ourself at that level through these videos. Just right now, with the screen, it's possible to look at yourself, look at the way you're holding your head, the muscles in your face. So we have tools that they didn't have in the past. Visual tools, recording tools, the sound of our voice. We can begin to look at some of the habitual ways we speak to become aware of certain patterns, expressions within ourselves. Because we can be in this state of self-reflectivity, looking at the image of ourself, analyzing the image of ourself. This is also where group work becomes essential. Because you may be in that state of sleep and not observe something but someone else in the group can be in the self-reflective, personally conscious, mindful state and see something in you and tell you about it. And this should be the essence, at least of the mindful, personally conscious partnership. You'll have someone else in your life because they can see things about you that you cannot see. Mr. Gurdjieff set J.G. Bennett up. J.G. Bennett didn't uh, really describe the whole situation, but Mr. Gurdjieff forced him to become aware of his difficulty in saying no and trying to please everyone all the time. And J.G. Bennett wrote this in a letter to the woman who, he was still married to his first wife, who was you know, 20 years his senior, Mrs. Beaumont, um, Pierre Elliott's uh, blood aunt. But his second wife, um, who became his last wife, you know, she was his girlfriend then. And he wrote a letter to her. And she said, I've been trying to tell you this for a while. He couldn't see it, but she could. So you can ask your family. You can ask people who know you, what is my worst fault? What is my worst problem? And if you do not let your ego get involved, you can begin to see things about yourself. And again, something else, the ego exists in world 48. You will never get rid of the ego until you bury your body. It will be buried with your body. The ego 
is there. But the ego should just be a function that you can consciously or self-reflectively or personally consciously pull out, stick on your face when you need it, and then take it and put it in your back pocket. But for most people, the ego is their self. And they live from within the ego. And they're like fish in water and they don't see the ego. They don't see that it's a function. So, you know, putting all of these things together, understanding all of these things give us great insight. An awakened man is not contrary to what they teach in the East, an expression of God, a manifestation of God. An awakened man is on the realm of the angels. At the higher story, at the upper story of their three-story being, is the holy denying. So they are in direct contact with the lowest level of the Godhead. And so they are more divinized than other people, but at their lowest level of the three-story being, they exist at the mindful, personally conscious level. And between world 12 and world 24, we become third force blind. And the ultimate trinity then splits into separate dualities. So the trinity of love, peace, and joy, head, body, and heart, at that higher level, Mr. Gurdjieff said these are spiritualized parts, the head, body, and heart. At that level, there's an indivisibility to them, but we can talk about parts of them. As it goes from 12 down to 24, they split. And not only do they split, they split into their opposites. So love becomes love and hate, or love and anger. Actually, anger is the proper polarity. Peace and fear, joy and despair. And at this level, the level of personal consciousness is equivalent within the biblical metaphor of the wilderness years. The lower level is slavery. The higher level is the land of milk and honey and the building of the temple. But the wilderness years is a tremendous bitterness to that level. J.G. Bennett said it was very emotionally reactive. And, you know, Mr. Gurdjieff's love of consciousness, love of hope, love of faith, you know, love of, you know, you know, love of feeling invokes or provokes its opposite. The middle one is this mindful level. So someone, you know, a couple can be completely in love one minute and then something happens and they turn into the worst enemies the next. Because these are two sides of that coin. Um, there's a book, I forget it, I think it's called Stripping the Gurus. Um, someone wrote it, and he went and looked at all sorts of various gurus. And look, they have feet of clay. Look, they get angry. So they can't be gurus. To expect a guru, to expect an awakened person to be God is unrealistic. Mr. Gurdjieff went out of his way to show people this level of his own being. I mean, when you think of the extraordinary vulnerability that that would take for a normal person, a lot of these gurus, a lot of these people who are considered divine beings, they go out of their way to hide that dimension. They've got an inner circle of devotees who clean up some of that mess, and it's what is hidden. 
behind closed doors. Mr. Gurdjieff refused to do that. He wanted people to see that dimension, to see that he was not perfect, that he made mistakes. So this exposes and shows some of the myths that have seeped in through Eastern thought. Now, if you're a seven-year-old boy and you are left outside a monastery and they shave your head and they put you in saffron-colored robes and you take the monastic vows, not just of celibacy, but to lead a certain life, and you spend 30 years behind monastic walls, there's an in tremendous training to live within a certain way. And so people will not see the reactive self. It's hidden behind the vows, behind the saffron robes and the shaved head and whatever. But Mr. Gurdjieff also said, what you do is take a monk outside of a monastery and this becomes more apparent. It doesn't mean that they aren't monks. It doesn't mean that they aren't centered at a higher level. Unfortunately, we can only see to our own level. So someone in the state of waking sleep cannot see someone who is personally conscious. They cannot see someone who's awake. Someone who's awake can see people who are personally conscious and people who are asleep. So there's a lot of hypnosis about this whole issue. Someone then says, I'm awake, I'm awake. And they convince enough people and people start to say, he's awake. You know, within esoteric schools, within mystery schools, there is that inner circle that is awake. And they can go, no, you're not. Get out of here. We don't want you in this monastery or hermitage anymore. You're in a state of delusion. But here in the West, they can write books. And, you know, they have one taste of the awakening state. And they think it indicates that they're an awakened being. And they don't realize that they have to have that taste thousands of times and to grow it, to get to that level. So working through all of this, understanding all of this, putting it together in a meaningful way, looking at the cosmological aspects, looking at the uh, aspects of organic life, looking at the psychological aspects, tasting, perceiving, trying to become aware of these different levels within you. If you want to get a taste of your metallic self, this is real low, 768 in terms of hydrogens. Many women have had a taste, not of the metallic self, but of the beginning of its absence. And this is anemia. This is where, you know, either through their menstrual cycle or whatever, they are leaking iron and they're losing iron and they don't have the sufficient quantity of iron in their blood. And so rather than understanding the metallic self, they can get an, a sense of what its absence is like. And so through all of this, through understanding the microcosmic, the macrocosmic, the psychological, the cosmological, we can really begin to build up a picture of ourself. We can really begin to understand ourselves. I mean, contemporary psychology, you know, Freud and Jung and Fromm and Adler, to me, they were great navel gazers. To try to understand ourselves separate from reality, 
is to start from the position of an error. And the, the, the other thing is, we owe a tremendous debt of gratitude, not just to Mr. Gurdjieff, but the masters of wisdom that developed this. I mean, within Beelzebub of Tales, Mr. Gurdjieff talks about the Society of Akal Dans. That was started by someone he named Bal Kultasi back in Atlantis. And the Society of Akal Dans developed this wisdom over 700 years. And it, they got to such a complex understanding of it that they had to break it down into sub-specializations. And on Monday, they would do one thing, and Tuesday another, and Wednesday another, and there would be specialists. And we don't have that. That was lost. But the most essential... <laughs> the most essential ingredients have been preserved so the ancient diagram of all living things the ray of creation the food diagrams which I, I will begin to get into uh, you know in the next few weeks just the tiniest remnant of this massive ancient science of being, science of transformation, has been passed down. J.G. Bennett said it had been passed down for 50 generations. And if a generation is 20 years, he's wrong. It's more like 500 generations. Mr. Gurdjieff talked about the masters of wisdom. He didn't use the term, the inner circle of humanity. The core of conscious individuals and every now and again, they release seeds of this information to see how they grow. And it was being greatly implied that these seeds are released at times when epics change. And so it could be the fall of a civilization. Uh, he also mentioned climate change. Um, Mr. Gurdjieff brought these seeds and scattered them in such barren soil in the West. In the you know, 1910 era, that was the end of the Western empires, the British Empire. It was the beginning of modernity. Weapons had changed. Warfare had changed. The First World War. Huge, major, epical changes. And we are still living in that epical change. With, uh, and it's got accelerated with information technology and computers, climate change. So these are the key periods in human history when this knowledge is released back into the world. And this knowledge, I mean, to figure this out again, you know, the amount of effort, um, something that I've spent a lot of time studying with and that I work with with various clients is something called dialectical behavior therapy. Uh, it's for people who suffer from borderline personality disorder, and it was developed by a lady called Dr. Marsha Linehan. And in terms of understanding ourselves as three brain beings, she has gotten it so close, but she doesn't realize where the various different things quite fit in. But, you know, there's a module, emotion regulation, the emotional self. 
There's a distress tolerance skill that was developed from cognitive behavioral therapy, which is the head brain sum. So the recognition that beliefs and thoughts can cause problems or emotions can cause problems. And then there's a lot of that program that's really designed to get people back in touch with their bodies, to calm their bodies down. It hasn't been organized in the proper way. But I, when I first came across it, I was gobsmacked at how close she had come, like 80%. But in a sense, trying to reinvent the wheel. And if you have this theory, if you have this understanding, it puts you so much farther ahead. It's like this is a gift to us from the past. When Mr. Gurdjieff was a young boy, teenager, he grew convinced that a lost civilization of an incredibly high order had existed in the past. And he and one of his friends decided to go in search of these lost teachings. And then he met the seekers of the truth, most of them twice his age, three times his age, and they were all devoted to the same thing. And he, there were ski, the seeds scattered through Sufism, through Hinduism, Tibetan Buddhism, esoteric Christianity. But somewhere along the way, he came in contact with this brotherhood, with this inner circle. And not only these diagrams on the screen, the ray of creation, the ancient diagram of all living things, the food diagrams, and the enneagram. They're all connected. They're all ways of representing this ancient wisdom and understanding it in relation to ourselves. So we stand on the shoulders of giants and we owe such a debt of gratitude to those who had slowly and methodically developed this over immense periods of time. And then we owe an equal debt of gratitude to those who preserved it in secret for perhaps 500 generations. It's, uh, um, I remember watching a Joe Rogan video featuring Graham Hancock, the British author, Food of the God, or Fingerprints of the Gods, and um, where he looked at lost civilizations. Graham Hancock was the East Africa reporter for The Economist, and he was told that the Ark of the Covenant was in Ethiopia, and he began to go in search of it, and he wrote a book. But through that, he became acquainted with the writings and the work of John Anthony West, and they became friends. And John Anthony West, um, uh, Magical Egypt, the series, uh, came out of John Anthony West's knowledge. And that was connected to Shuala de Lubavitch's work on the Temple of Man in Karnak. But Anthony West was a Gurdjieffian. So he was predisposed to think that uh, Egypt had the remnants of this lost civilization. And that Egypt was already fully formed at its beginning. There was no evolution upwards. So it had to come from somewhere else. And then Graham Hancock ran with it. And I saw him on the Joe Rogan experience. And he mentioned a man's name by Randall Carlson. And Joe Rogan, I <laughs> here's a real crackpot. And then I went and found the next video with Joe Rogan, where Graham Hancock was on it. And lo and behold, he brought Randall Carlson as his guest. And his latest book, his update, is on the work of Randall Carlson, a polymath, um, uh, sacred geometry, uh, all sorts of things. But an amateur geologist. And he is assembling the collection 
and there are now legitimate scientists who have come above the parapet, and they are also assembling the evidence that 12,800 BC, a massive comet broke into four pieces, hit the ice shields. Here in Toronto, we were under a mile of ice. And he said as a result of this comet, and he's shown the geological patterns, the erosion patterns, within two weeks, it had all melted. Temperatures 17 degrees Fahrenheit, I'm not sure what that is in uh, Celsius, they spiked up. Sea levels in two weeks rose between 350 and 400 feet. Mr. Gurdjieff talks about the second transalpian perturbation, you know, the destruction of Atlantis. And we are now beginning to assemble the geological evidence that there was a massive flood and it was related to the melting of the glaciers, not just some of the fragments at the glacial realm in North America and some in Europe. And overnight, this massive cataclysm, this massive flooding. And as Mr. Gurdjieff talks about in Beelzebub Tales, the, there were remnants, there were survivors. There were people who were not in that center. And they coalesced. Some came together in Egypt. Some in Central, uh, um, or the Middle East, um, Tigris, Euphrates, Gobekli Tepe was built by them, the Sphinx. And some went to Egypt. They went to these places that were really fertile. And then they had to slowly plant these seeds in the minds of the primitive people they found there. And they also had to keep this knowledge separate and hidden because of our wiseacring and our attempt to distort it. You have three brothers. Their father's a mystical teacher, seer, and he teaches them. And one is more intellectual. The other, because he's not so intellectual, develops his body and he's more physical. And the other, because he's not quite intellectual and not quite as strong and as physical, he develops his emotions. And they hear the same truth. And then they move to three distant lands. And they teach their children, and their children get taught, and their children get taught. And over time, the knowledge degenerates to a certain degree. It begins to drift apart. So 20 generations later, their descendants come together. And they will have three. There will be a basis to understanding, but it will be different. And this is why, you know, the, 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 the brotherhood, whoever they are, wherever they are, had to do it from initiate to initiate in secret to preserve this knowledge and to release it to the world as it has been released in the last hundred years. So things to think about. Um, Mr. Gurdjieff, you know, it's the novel. A novel is fiction, Atlantis, lost civilizations. But he also affirmed the reality of it through some of his talks. So we are building, and we're not building because they had this huge building, but we still have the foundation stones. And to figure this out ourselves would take at least 700 years, and we can kickstart it. And so, um, any questions? Let me uh, get off this. Stop sharing. <laughs>
Um, any questions, any comments? Uh, I've hit you with a lot today. <laughs> Let me unmute everyone. Uh, any comments, any questions? I mean, I'm going to go, you know, into the food diagrams. Um, so that's really specifically about ourselves. Uh, yeah, uh, do you have a question, um, Hamed, but you just can't say it because of your microphone? If you do, you can type it. And I'm we can re Pardon? I've given you a lot to digest today. <laughs> Um, been and it'll be interesting, Alan. And it'll be continued. Um, I've been working on this for 38 years now. 38 years ago, I didn't realize I was working on this, but now I do. And uh, I have this abnormal genetic aspect of my brain where I see underlying patterns. Uh, my father had it. And he said, as a little boy, he noticed that I was the only child who had it, and I'm the youngest. There were these like mechanical fish with a magnet, and you would try and fish. And he said, I learned not to put the magnet by the mouth, but to find where the magnet was. And so I, he, he trained me to see this. So to look for the clues following my name, the underlying patterns. Um, so I have this facility. And I, I, you know, times it's driven me crazy, this facility, but at other times it's been my salvation. Um, I have Ian. a bit of a question. Uh, uh, maybe I'm sure you were talking about the, the mechanical self and the habitual self and how um, some habits we can, you know, sort of consciously break yeah. the legs in the pants and some like words we just, you know, can't really do anything about. Yeah. I'm wondering if you could kind of describe what uh, a, a beneficial or helpful attitude towards our mechanical self would look like. Like, how, how do we approach it? How do we understand it best? Okay. Um, I mean, you cannot get rid of it. Um, it is there. But, you know, it's not like we have to erase it. We've got to erase the subject of delusional qualities. Um, so there's a lot of subjective thinking, delusional thinking, illusional thinking that we have to get rid of. Mr. Gurdjieff said you have to get rid of all your beliefs. Um, a belief is a mental shortcut. It's a mental habit. Uh, it means you don't have to think through it. But, you know, beliefs are like a virus, and you can pick them up from the world around you. So one thing we can do at that level is to work on the level of beliefs. Um, and the other thing to do is, uh, you know, this is a very subconscious level as well. And every act of mindful awareness is a harmonization of the conscious and the subconscious. Every act of mindful awareness is bringing ourselves into a degree of unity. So your subconscious self, like your lower self, was fully aware of your body, the sensation of clothing, the air that touches your face, all of that. By becoming conscious of that, we are harmonizing the two. We are not getting rid of the lower, but we are bringing a certain harmony with it by bringing our awareness up to the higher. Um, all of these things of breaking habits and whatever are designed, or not all of it, but they are in part designed to show us just how habitual and automatic we are. To just focus on one thing, to focus on stepping up a set of stairs, and to realize that we forget all the time to harmonize this higher level this mindful awareness with the lower level. Um, I mean, the other thing is, if you were um, a physicist and the laws of motion 
and you were a biologist uh, with all of the synapses and things that have to go on, the millions of calculations are, that would be required, that are required for you to walk towards any set of stairs and land on that first step in a real balanced way without having to think about it. All of these calculations are occurring at the subconscious level. They are there. If you had to consciously walk and then step, you would lack the fluidity. You would lack the motion. Um, but to become aware of that. Um, the thing is, it's not really to start using the left foot. That is to show you how much asleep you are, how unconscious you are. And that's to alter that program ever so slightly. The real goal is to be aware of yourself, to be personally conscious, to be aware of yourself walking towards the stairs. And then it doesn't matter if you use your normal leg, as long as you do that with awareness. Um, I don't know if that's an answer. Uh, yeah, that, that's helpful. Thank you. Uh, yeah. It's more of a more of a uh, blending for an awareness than a than a fighting yeah. kind of attitude. Yeah. I mean, well, these are tasks that we set will tasks at the beginning. Um, you know, to you know, the in the foundation, one of the ones they teach is learning how to just wash dishes with the muscles needed. Now, no, you know, everyone's got dishwashers, but you would wash your dish with your jaw and your shoulders and you, and it's like, no, I just need my arm. And part of it as well is that we waste a lot of, uh, one of the forms of uh, physical identification, one of the ways we waste and leak energy is through, you know, excessive movement and holding our muscles and relaxation is very important. So to try to walk towards the step as relaxed as possible, as calm and as peaceful as possible. Um, at any rate, uh, it's noon. Um, I want to thank you all for coming today, listening to me uh, rant on and talk. But uh, um, So uh, everyone take care um, next week. Um, bye. Thank you. Thank you.